Wednesday night in the wonderful world of kart racing. How's everyone doing tonight? Gonna hang out for a few, let a few more people get up here before we get started. Uh, All right, uh, tonight I'm going to go over something we get a few calls about here and there, a few emails about, um, you know, installing a, one of our billet side covers on on your uh, Honda's clones, Predator style engines. It's a simple, simple process, but, you know, we, we um, have a lot more stuff in our kit than most people do. And it's kind of confusing at times for people. So I've been asked this a lot of times. And I was asked this, I know, six, seven, eight times at the Ohio show this past weekend, you know, about, you know, how to install it, what to use, why do these parts come with it, you know, um, when and where do I use them. So I figured I'd go over that. Um, hoping this is going to be just a quick video tonight. Um, go ahead and get in here and get it done and get it over with. So, um I ain't got to stay up all night re-watching this or whatever. All right. Hey, we got a few people on here. Your basic ARC billet side cover. I'm going to go over the ones tonight primarily, you know, just for the, the clone and the Predator engines. I mean, but we make billet side covers for, you know, flatheads. We make them for Blockzillas. We make them for the animal engines. Um, we also have them for the big blocks, the GX390. And we have our uh, our new 10 bolt side cover uh, for the for the big 460 big blocks. Um, and this procedure, yes, Nicholas, this procedure I'm going to go over here is the same basic procedure on any of our billet side covers. You know, for the flathead, big block, you know, Predator, Honda clone, whatever. It's the same basic procedure. Uh, the parts may be a little different, but um, everything in here you can use on all of them. So this is one here for, this is the 6057. Uh, this, this billet side cover here uh, fits the Honda clone engines, and it also fits the Predator Hemi. Uh, if you remember a few videos back, I've done a video on the differences between the three generations of Predators and, and some of the similarities that the clone and the Predator have as far as parts. This is another part they have in common. The Hemi Predator takes the same side cover as the Honda clone engine does. So you'll need a part number 6057. Uh, the one for the non-Hemi Predator, it's basically the same cover. There's only one difference in it, and I'll go over that here in a few minutes when I get all the parts out. But anyway, this is a billet side cover for a Honda clone or a Predator Hemi engine. You'll get in the pack, you'll get... The side cover, most of the time, the bearings will already be installed, and there'll be a piece of tape over it like you see here. And there's dual bearings in there. I mean, you know, there's two bearings side by side. Usually the uh, oil shields will be off of them, and they'll be taped in. And sometimes we, we screw the oil uh, field plugs in. Sometimes we don't. Either way. Um, You'll also get this pack of accessories here that you'll need to install this on a Honda, a clone, or a Hemi. And the reason we put, you know, extra shims and all in here is because these these engines they're not all the same. Now, even the Honda blocks, you get a genuine Honda GX200. There'll be some variances in how wide the block is, so. We try to put enough stuff in the pack so that you can set your end play on you know whatever engine you put it on, whether it be a Honda, whether it be a clone, or a Hemi. You can set the end play with everything that's in the pack here 99.9% .9 of the time. I have seen a couple of blocks that um, I had to go outside of this pack and, and, and to get uh, end play, but it's very, very, very rare. All right. In the pack, you'll get this. You'll get a bag of bolts, which is, you know, they're Allen head bolts. They're metric. Uh, the head size of them for the Allen wrench is a 6 millimeter. Um, you'll also 
I'm dropping stuff here. You'll also get in that same pack, you'll get some little where they at? There they are. Uh, some little uh, plug screws. Uh, we have a oil drain at the bottom of our side covers. Uh, you can use it. Some people do, some don't. Some use the ones that's naturally in the block. Either way, um, you get that, and you get two small ones that you know you can plug these up up here if you want to. These are vent holes for venting the crankcase. Uh, modified engines, especially stroker engines. Um, you need to vent the crankcase, and we put these crankcase vents in all of our side covers. Um, just the, the standard, I don't have one here, that's something I didn't bring. Oh, they're on this. The standard, uh, man, I'm butterfinger tonight, bar that you use um, in your valve cover to, uh, to pulse your fuel pump with, it's the same thread. So you can use those exact same uh, barbs, hose barbs in there. They screw down, tighten up. You can use one, you can use two. That's up to you. And then why you need to use one or two is a, I'll get into that a little later on. I'm just going to try to go over, you know, what comes in the pack and how you use it. But anyway, you get those plugs. You can use the oil hole plug at the bottom. You can plug those up or you can put the barbs in it for, for venting. Um, you also get this bag here. This has the, uh, the crank shims. This is one of the ways that you set in play on your crankshaft. You should get, you know, four of these. There'll be uh, two thin ones and two thick ones. I think the thin ones are like five or seven thousand. I think the thick ones are like ten thousand. Uh, but you should get two of each. Um, in that pack, you'll also get the four dowel pins that go in the block. You'll get four solid pins like this. And these pins go in each of the of the uh, dowel holes that are used for the block. You know, a standard side cover uh, only uses these two here and here in the block. Our billet side cover uses all four that's in the block, the top, the bottom, and each side. And these solid dowel pins, you can either, I like sticking them in the block first and then putting the side cover on, but you get all four, and that's what they're used for. You know, top, bottom, left, right. Now, in some cases, the billet side cover, because of all the block variances and stuff that we got, that we see with these clones, even the Hondas, I've had some Hondas that wouldn't fit just right with all four dowel pins in it. Um, you know, sometimes uh, the block, the hole in the block may not be exactly the right size, might be a little too tight. Sometimes you may have to just kind of file the sharp edge down on these dowel pins a little bit, and they'll go in the block. But always try all four dowel pins first. You know, uh, uh, put the pins in, try to put it on the block, make sure they line up. If you can't get it to fit, um, remove the dowel pin at the very bottom. Because nine times out of ten, the one on the bottom is the one that's off a little bit from all the ones I've seen. Um, you'll still have, you know, three dowel pins and one at the top that holds the jug, which to me, this is one of the most important ones, this one, because um, it helps hold the jug on better. But anyway, try to use all four dowel pins if you can. Um, if you can't, remove the one on the bottom. And this, the dowel pin area, is where the, the Hemi and the non-Hemi side cover is different. Uh, the ones for the Hemi take the same size as, as the clone of the Honda does. Most of you know that the non-Hemi Predator, the dowel pins in the side cover, the natural ones, what I call the ones that come from the factory, they're bigger. They're bigger around than the uh, clone one is. Um, so you'll have to use the two um, that come OEM in the non-Hemi Predator on the side-to-side -side, um, dowel pins here and here. But you'll use the solid ones at the bottom and at the top. That's just in the non-Hemi. That's the only difference, really, in the two side covers is the dowel pins. The dowel pins in the non-Hemi are bigger. The ones in the Hemi are the same size as the clone. Um, but outside of that, uh, you'll also get inside the kit 
on this, this rubber O-ring right here. And this is what sets our side covers apart from a lot of the others. If you notice, there's a ring all the way around the side cover. That's where this rubber ring right here goes. It goes inside that cutout and gives complete seal. Sometimes, rarely, sometimes, you'll have to use the paper gasket that we send with you. I'll get into that on wine all here in a minute. Um, every once in a while, but we always send a paper gasket along with the shims because when I get into showing you how to set your end plate, you'll see where these come in into play. Uh, and you also will get a, a oil seal, crank seal, oil seal, whatever they call it. This is a seal you'll get. And of course, just like you know, regular side covers, you know, they go right here. Um, but that's just a little overview of the parts that come with it. I mean, you get you get four shims, uh, you get the rubber road ring, you get the paper gasket. I don't know what in the world they're in there doing, um, but all these parts come with it so that we can help you better set your in play where you need to. Because if you don't have all these ways of setting your in play. If you if you got too much or you got too little, then it could be a problem. Um, that's that's what sets ours above a lot of the others. And for those of you that don't know, when I say the word in play, what I'm talking about is is when the side cover is bolted on the engine, how much play your crankshaft has while it, you know you got to have everything torqued down tight, you know, all four dial pins in, the rubber O-ring on. And when you go to put your side cover on, you know, you, you, you want to start with the, the thinnest shim on. And, you know, the in, crank in play is nothing more than how much the crank moves in and out the block while everything is tight. And I'll show you all how to set that in a little bit. But I just want to, you know, for the ones that don't know, that's what it is. You want to be able to move the crank in and out. Um, but there's lots of debate on what, how much in play is enough, how much is not enough. Um, I got what I do, and if other people do it, that's great. If not, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I've been setting in play the same on engines for, you know, well over 20 years. Um, but that's all in play is. Now, um, to uh, start putting the side cover together, like I say, as usual, I go through this really fast. <laughs> Watch it again. It's going to be uploaded. No big deal. <clears throat> the bearings are already in it. I recommend when you get it, taking this tape off. And the bearings usually will fall right out. It's a slip fit, interference fit. You see, they, they come right out. You just push them right on out. And there's two of them in there. And the reason that we use two bearings is what that does is that helps eliminate crankshaft flex. It doesn't stop it. Nothing completely stops crankshaft flex. If something like a crankshaft has to flex or to break. It just eliminates how much it flexes. When you get two bearings, the crankshaft touches it in two places per bearing gives you four points of contact, which helps control the uh, crank flex. And the billet side cover what <laughs> he's laughing at in there. He must be watching me. And the billet side cover, you know, with it being so thick, so rigid, you know, really strong material, along with using the four dowel pin bolts, helps control block flex and fatigue. So this together really helps tie your block, you know, it makes it a, a more a more uh, unified package, you know, because the top dowel pins up here um, go in going right here on the block. You know, it's right here. And that that ties, that helps tie the bottom uh, jug, the bottom part of the um, crankcase to the jug. Because this pin being right here, it helps helps control a little bit of flex and, you know, the side cover being so rigid helps control, you know, it just helps control block flex and fatigue. And, you know, with modified stuff, that, that's a big, a big plus. Um, but like I was saying, take the bearings out because they come with this uh, grease in them. I don't know if you can see that. You see the bearings 
have grease in it. Um, take your parts washer, some carb cleaner, square it on, spray it out, you know, blow it out with air hose, and get that grease out um, because it needs you know regular oil in there. Um, that's just a packing that comes from the factory that way. I put them in without removing that and didn't have a problem, but I'm just you know I'd, I'd rather have them clean with my oil in it than having this grease floating around in my engine. And um, let's see, I've never heard it really causing a problem. It's just something I like to do, but the bearings, um, to go back in, once you get everything cleaned up, you know, take the oil plugs out, wash the cover, clean it up real good, soap and water, blow it off with an air hose, and when you go to putting your bearings back in, like I say, sometimes um, they're, they're a slip fit, interference fit, but sometimes you can just take your thumb and just kind of rock them right on back in, and now it's going to make a liar out of me. But... Like I say, you got to get them lined up just right, and they'll fall right in. And I have got this one jammed in there. Hmm. How about that? But we're going to proceed. They slip right in. i just done this wrong. So even I mess up sometimes. But the uh, get your bearings back in. They fall right in. And then you just... Once you get the bearings back in, like I can't do right now. <laughs> ha! There it went. Don't be scared to put a little persuasion behind it. I ain't saying hit it with a hammer. Um, but, you know, lay it down on the table, take your palm, and just push it right in. You can Sometimes you can rock them side to side, or you just take your palm and just kind of push it, and they're both in there. I'm not trying to pull no video. No, no trick photography here or nothing. They're both in there. All right. And then that way, you know, you can put whatever, you know, oil you're using to assemble with down in the bearing and everything is, is, is lubed the same. And I, the question I get all the time, what do I use for an assembly lube? I use whatever oil I'm going to use to break the engine in with. So, if I'm going to break it in with, you know, our Lucas, I assemble with Lucas. If you're building, if you run Thor, assemble with Thor. If you run Mobile One, assemble with Mobile One. Don't don't use assembly lube. I don't like assembly lube on these connecting rods because they're splash lube. And you put that thick assembly lube inside that rod, when you fire that engine up, it that rod will spin several times, probably 15, 20, if not 30 revolutions before that assembly lube slings out of it and oil gets in. So... Whatever oil you plan on running or breaking in with, that's what you need to assemble the engine with. That way you can shake it up, everything is good and oil, you fire it up, good to go. Alright, off topic. Your seal. You know, it, it, it presses in just like any other uh, side cover. Um, some people have problems getting these in here. I um, don't really know why. Most of the time I put them in with my thumbs. Just like I would a uh you know on a stock side cover you just get it lined up and usually you can kind of work it right on around and once you get it started like that and get it in there fairly good you can take a you know a, a small mallet and just kind of make sure that it you know is, is flat and inside the cover evenly all the way around. Do like that. Put it in with my hands. Some people say they beat them in with hammers. I just put them in with my hands on live TV. But, well, live Facebook, not TV. All right. Bearings are in, cleaned. Both in there. Seal in there. Like I say, you can get it started with your thumbs or whatever, or you can lay it flat on a table and just kind of tap around it with a hammer, a mallet. Don't use a hammer, <laughs> use a mallet. And But just make sure that the, the seal is all the way in and it's flush with the top of the cover. All right, got that in. Now, another big thing we get a lot of questions about and a lot of calls about and get cussed at about is installing this rubber O-ring. Um, yes, it is. It's not, you know, a lot of people get it and they say, hey, my rubber O-ring's broken when I got it. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be one long piece. And that's because the way we put it in, it needs to be broken. 
and plus they don't make them in that one size so to put this in all you'll need is your hands and a small flathead screwdriver or a small Phillips screwdriver or a push rod. This is a standard push rod out of a Predator engine, non-hemi. What you do, or what I do, I start right here in between the two vent holes. Just get it started there with my finger. Then you take your screwdriver or push rod, press it down, you know, so that you're even on the top of the cover, and just follow the line. This is easier to do with two hands instead of one, but having to usually I lay it down flat on a table and can run this thing around in less than five seconds most of the time. But because I'm having to do it one-handed, This will slightly stretch the O-ring around. You don't want to you don't want to pull it tight and put it in. A lot of people said they stretch it out and it makes it thinner. Well, that's it'll get it in there quicker. But when you stretch it out and make it thin, this rubber is going to rebound. And when you go to try to put the cover on, it's going to pop out. Like I say, it's hard to do holding it up like this. But I'm just trying to show y'all. You know, you just kind of run it around the valley and this thing is making me look like an idiot tonight usually I can do that on my own I don't need something else I need like an idiot that is the hardest part to do right there because once you get on around that you can let it go with the flow baby that one area right there and right there is the hardest two places to do but now ain't got nothing but highway and once you get it around to the top, when they when they meet right there, get you a really, really sharp knife. A razor blade is the best. And and try try to cut it right there on the overlap. You want them to touch together. If there's a very, very small gap in there, that's fine. I mean, you don't want no 40, 50 thousandths gap. You want them as close to the end as you get. You don't want them to overlap, but you want them to touch. And because when you put this cover on, and when you put it on, you torque it down. And yes, it is in there. Just to show everybody. The ring is in there all the way around. But when you put this up there and torque it to the block, the O-ring is going to compress and expand out. So if there's a very, very small gap in between that, it's fine. It will connect. Never had a problem with it. But you want to cut it as close to the other tip as you can with a razor blade. Sharp and quick. Cut it and you're done. Right, I'm going to take this out so that it don't slap me in the face as I'm doing other stuff. But that's how simple it is to put that in there. Once you start here, you lay, it's best, like I say, to lay it on the table because I'm holding it with my hands and everything's flopping around. Lay it on the table and you just follow, hold it up in front of you. Like I said, don't stretch it, but just hold it and let it, you know, naturally stretch through here. And just follow the valley all the way around. And it goes right in. As little gap as possible up top, and you'll be good to go. All right, now your cover is assembled. You got your bearings in it, they're clean. You got them lubed. You got your seal in, everything's good. You got your O ring in. Um, now you're ready to put it on the block. I typically take the dowel pins, whether it's you know all four of the solid ones for the Hemi and the clone, or two of the solid ones. You know, for the and the uh, OEM ones for the Predator, and the part numbers on these. I probably should have said this at the beginning, but like I said, I told you at the beginning, this is a 6057. This is for the Hemi or the the Honda Clone engines. The one for the non-Hemi is a part number 6058. Um, different part numbers. The only difference in them is the size of the dowel pins from the Clone and the Hemi. To the non hemi um, but either way put your four dial pins in the block first and when you get these dial pins you'll see one side has a slight taper to it and the other side is kind of squared what I do is you could take some 
some sandpaper or a file. I use my crankshaft polisher. And a square end, I just take that tip and just kind of just kind of buff it off a little bit. And that side, the non-flared side, see that side's got a little taper to it. The non-taper side, kind of buff it a little bit, and I put that in the block first. If you line it up just right, you can take like a a little bit of small hammer and just kind of just and it taps right into the block. Make sure there's no liquids or fluids inside the hole because it'll push it back out. You make sure all your holes are clean. You know, blow them out, make sure they're clean, they, and put these in the block first. Now that everything's assembled, what you want to do is start with the thinnest shim. And like I say, you got some thick ones and you got some thin ones. Find the thinnest one, put it on the engine first, and it will go over the crank, it'll slide on the crankshaft and go over and cover up the gear. Now, the reason you're doing that. You, you got that you really need to have a shim on it at all times um, because that gear you know the crankshaft moves in and out and you just don't want it we've got this machined out to where it's not supposed to touch but some of these gears they're not cut straight some of them's got a slight arc at the top of them they'll stick out you know, it's kind of hard to tell which ones it is until you get them on here and they scrub but you need to start you need to run at least one shim on it 99.999 percent of the engines you're going to have to run one to three shims on anyway um but start with the thinnest shim put it on slide your side cover on now once you get up to where the dowel pins are something you most of the time you're gonna have to kind of you know wiggle the side cover around you know don't don't put it up there and try to force it on you know don't put it up there and put the bolts in it and try to run it up there you know make sure the side cover goes on the engine and because if you you've got something like I say, if the dowel pins aren't lined up just right or something, you could damage you know, the side cover, but you definitely damage the block because the side cover is a lot stronger than the block is, and anything that's in the way, it's going to push it out. Um, but get you a rubber mallet, you know, a wooden mallet, plastic mallet, but use a mallet. Line up your dowel pins and just go around it and just tap it up in there, just like, um, just like Happy Gilmore, just tap, tap, tap a roof. And tap it up there until it, you know, it pretty much bottoms out on the block. Then take your six Allen bolts that come here with you know, the six millimeter heads and get them started. Sometimes even getting them started once it's on the pins, you may have to kind of wiggle stuff around because you know, th these blocks are so mass produced that some of the holes are tens of thousands off, and you know the bolts might have a little hard time starting some of them will go right in some of them will kind of feel a little um it'll be a little feel a little tighter i mean you're not gonna cross or nothing like that but it just feels a little tighter but just you know go on run them on down bottom them out and i always torque my side cover i go you know it don't matter which side you start on this side side to side and then cross them you know here 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 and here and here but that's only after you've made sure that it taps up onto the block and all the pins are, are lining up because sometimes this bottom one just don't do it on some blocks don't know um, made in China made in America do totally different things they don't always line up but most of the time they will I hadn't run into a block in quite a while that all four pins you know don't work into nicely um, I had several when we first built these things um, that you had to take the bottom pin out of every single one of them. And now, I guess the um, the uh, quality control is a little better over there. But um, once you get it up there, get the bolts tightened down, you ain't got to, you know, torque them. I torque mine to 220. Um, you can just torque them to 200 pounds. That's fine. But just make sure they all four or all six are torqued. Now is when you check your end plate. That's why you start with the rubber O-ring and the thinnest shim. You get it torqued up on there around 200 inch pounds and that's inch pounds not foot pounds and all you do is you just grab the end of your crankshaft and move it and you know you see how much movement you got hopefully um you're going to have way too much i like to run no more than ten thousandths. i like actually around five if, if if that's where my engines just lined up but um a lot of people say you need, 
you know, 15, 20. Back in the flathead days, you could see the crankshaft running out of some of them engines. Um, but that's a different engine. These clone engines, Hondas, uh, the Predators, the reason I like as little in play as possible because the camshaft here and the crank gear are slotted. You know, the, 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 the teeth on them are not straight. They're slotted, and they run against one another. And you got the crankshaft moving in and out. Let's say you got 20 thousandths in play on it. Uh, the cam naturally has about 10 or 15 on it. That's about what they average. And as the crank is running in and out, the cam's moving in and out, and it's changing the timing of the cam as it's running because those gears are working against one another. That's why I like as little in play as possible. Most of my engines, if you grab the crankshaft, you can hear it knock. That's it. You, you have to really look to see it move. And so this has got exactly 5,000 on it. I checked it today. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but but that's what in play is. You, you, you want to start with the thinnest shim, put it up there, torque it down, and check it. Most of the time, you're going to have way too much. So then you got to take the side cover back off. And to do that, we send out bolts that help you remove the side cover. These two holes here, here, and here. There's two threaded holes. These bolts right here go inside of them, and they hit the dowel pins. You got one here and one here, and you tighten them with an Allen wrench, and it pushes the side cover back off. Um, that's just something we put in there just because you know, these things and pins fit really good and tight. Now once the engines run, they'll come off a little easier, but brand new, it's hard to get them back off. Um, you can also take a rubber mallet, not a hammer, and just kind of, you know, tap it here, tap it here, and over on the side and get them off that way. Um, I really prefer using the bolts that we send with it because it pulls it off evenly and uniform. Um, once you get it off, um, put, you know, depending on how much in play, that's something you're going to have to, you know, learn to, to measure on your own, you know, as far as understanding how many more shims you need. Um, start with, you know, and then go to the next, the thickest shim. You know, your next one you put on will be the thickest one. Put it back on, torque it back down, check your in play. If you're still moving a lot, you know, I, I've rarely seen where you need all four shims. I don't think I've ever seen that, honestly. Usually, usually it winds up being, you know, two thick ones and one thin one is usually where you wind up at. And, um, okay. hey, buddy, how are you? You doing good? Okay, so am I. So, hey to everybody. Hey, to everybody. <laughs> okay, Landon said, hey, everybody. Um, but typically, you're going to wind up with two thick ones and a, and a thin one. That's where... Most of the engines, whether it be Predator or Clone or, or Hemi, non-Hemi, whatever, that's usually what they end up, is two thick ones and a thin one. Um, but start with a thin one and work yourself up. And once you get your in-place set, you know, to where you can, you know, feel it moving, but you can't see it moving a lot. Here comes that darn cat again every week. I will say when I was at the Ohio show this weekend, I had more people come up to me and talk about my cat in these videos than they actually did me. Um, but... He's back up here. Down, nobody wants to see you. Don't argue with me. He's like a teenage cat. You want to argue and back talk all the time. But, um, where was I at? Oh, yeah. Um, if for some reason you put the thinnest shim on and you torque it down and you have no end play, I mean, it does not move. First thing you need to do is take your rubber mallet, not a hammer, and bump each side of the crankshaft. You know, bump it here, bump it here, back and forth two or three times. Because sometimes, you know, the bearings are fit a little snug and the crankshaft's not able to move in it. So bump it back and forth a few times with a mallet, mallet, not a hammer. And sometimes if something's holding the crankshaft on the, you know, the bearing or something like that, it'll, it'll loosen it up and everything will be fine. But if you have zero in play, that is when you use the green gasket that comes with it. This is a 
Well, the green one will come with the Hemis and the clone, and a black one will come with the Predator because the different size uh, dial pin holes. And, oh, and what you do then, if you have zero in play with you know one shim, you have to take the side cover back off, leave the shim on it, but you'll remove the rubber O-ring. Because at this point, you, you don't need it. You're going to have to go to the paper gasket. Like I say, this is a rarity. This happens. I've never had to use one of these. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. All the engines I've built, I've never used one of these on it. I've always had my in place set properly with either one or three shims. I don't think I've ever used four. Um, but you, if you got to go to the paper gasket, and this is a last ditch effort, last resort, whatever you want to call it, you have to remove the rubber O-ring. You cannot run them together. You'll have, you won't be able to shim it enough, and the cam will run back and forth, and you'll have all kinds of problems. But remove the rubber O-ring, then put the paper gasket on the engine. And you're probably going to have to take some scissors or a knife and notch out for the, um, for the dowel pins on the top and the bottom. Dang, put it on there right, Jody. Lower. People are going to think you're a rookie here. But the bottom one lined up, the top one will not. As you see right there, the dial pin is right there. You're going to have to notch it out just a little bit. Don't cut all the way through it, but just notch it up about halfway into it, and the pin will fit. But like I say, this is a last resort. Put your paper uh, gasket on there. Again, the thinnest shim. Put your bolts back on, I mean, put your side cover back on, tap it up with a mallet, torque it back down to 200 pounds, and recheck the end plate. You should have, you know, a good bit then. And that's when you go back to, the, you know, you already got the thinnest one on there. Then you take it off and you put, you know, a thick one on it. Check it again. Take it off, put another thick one on it. And the people I've talked to that's had to use the paper gaskets, usually it winds up being the same thing, either... You know, a thin one and a thick one, or a thick one and two thin ones. Usually it's only three of the shim. Um, then everything, if the end play is right, you know, you got it where you can feel it move and it's not moving in and out real hard. 220 inch pounds and, and you're done. Simple as that. Um, and all of our billet side covers, of course, come with the, uh, our billet little oil fill caps, but... All of them are, are cut out or machined, you know, for just like a stock side cover would be. You know, the holes fit all of our chain guards and everybody else's chain guards also. But um, that's, in a nutshell, on the, uh, the billet side cover, you know, how it comes, the parts that come with it, and, you know, a basic run-through installation. You know, you just always want to start with the rubber O-ring, and the thinnest shim. Pork it down and kind of go from there. Once you've used our side cover several times and built several engines, you can start with the thinnest shim and you'll grab the crankshaft and say, this is the same the last one was, so you'll go ahead and put two thick ones on it. You know, you'll, you'll learn, you know, this is, a lot of this stuff is learned. Some people hook up dial indicators and this, that, and the other, and I don't care about that. I do it all, you know, <laughs> I've done it so long, I can grab a crankshaft and know how many shims it needs. Um, but, um, you know, they, they, at times, sometimes, you know, we're all human, um, humans, uh, set the machines up and humans bag all this stuff up and there's times, you know, a part may be left out, just call us up and, you know, we'll send it to you. But the, you've got to remember that, you know, there is a, will you shut up? you got to remember you know, that the, the, the Hemi and the clone take the same side cover. A lot of people think that because the Hemi takes the same side cover or the Hemi takes the same cam, that they take the same rod. I've got a whole video on this. It's I've done it a couple of months ago. It um, goes through all the differences. He's fine, baby. Well, obviously not. He wants out. Let him out. But um, a video I've done a few months ago on the differences between, you know, the Predators and the clones and all. Go back and watch that, and it'll explain what parts fit this and what parts don't. Um, but um, 
I guess I can go through now and answer a few questions as I run through that 900 miles an hour. Yeah, Nicholas, um, like I was saying before, um, this will be the same basic procedure for the 390 um, as it is for the um, for the. <laughs> I get him with a teddy bear. He jumped over the fence. We got a little gate there to, to keep landing out of here because. This is the, my pool table when I was in here. That's where I shoot my videos. I don't want him in here throwing pool balls around. But um, I was trying to get my wife's attention, and I hit right beside the cat, and he jumped over the fence. But the uh, the ones for the 390 come with the same basic um, parts. It comes with shims. Um, they they got uh, rubber O-rings in them also. It takes the same O-ring installation on it. It's the same. They come with dual bearings. Um, same thing on them. Take them out. Wash them. Um, They'll come with everything Everything this one's got. Same base procedure, um, except for the 10 bolt. Um, of course, the 10 bolt has more bolts than the 10 bolt. And sometimes I've run in, the, the ones that we've sold for those, I've called people on, and a couple of them's had the same problems with the dial pins, and which is odd because, you know, I think only one company makes the 460. I think two might now, but at the time we was making them, only one did. And, some of those on the bottom uh, won't fit, but um, yeah, 390 big blocks, flat heads, animals, it's all the same procedure. Start with a thin shim, O-ring, and torque it and go from there. Up in the snow in Connecticut. Well, Adam, like I say, I was at the Ohio Valley Karting Show last week, and I'm, I'm going to say that that was a really good show. Um, it was a long trip for me. It took me 11 hours to get up there because I got messed up in Cincinnati. Um, they had a mishap on the bridge, and I had to detour around. But anyway, it um, it was it was it was cold up there, and I'm from I'm in South Georgia, it's where I was born and raised. And when it gets in the 20s and 30s and teens, I'm I'm cold. But it was a very very good show, a very very good facility and was put on and run well. A lot of vendors, a lot of people. I was very impressed, and we will be going back. Um, but I don't like snow. I don't like cold weather. Um, Marvin Dollar, what's going on? Chicago, Illinois. Yep. Long way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeff, somebody should lock tight your fingers. Keep them off a the keyboard. <laughs> I knew I was going to get in trouble with that. I, I made a post earlier on my personal page about some Loctite. I don't like using it. And I knew it was going to come up in here. I knew it. I knew it. It's and it's not it's not hammer time, Josh. It's mallet time. You, do, you don't use hammers on these. You use mallets. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Dear Kitty. Yeah, the GX is, uh, actually most of Honda's stuff is made in Thailand now. All the stuff we get in um, is, is from Thailand. You know, the blocks, the side covers, the, I'm not sure where the cranks are made. I know all the parts, the seals, the gaskets, the valves, everything's made in Thailand. The valve springs, um, they're, they're all made in Thailand. I mean, they're still top quality stuff, good stuff. Yeah, Gerald, um, good meeting you also, um, Gerald and I. We will be coming back next year, or I will be coming back. Somebody somebody should be coming with me. If not, I'll do it by myself like I always do. Um, it's not that big a deal. 72 in, in Virginia. I think it was 74 or 75 here today. It's supposed to be 60-something tomorrow, but... Uh, Stuart, uh, you can put this billet side cover for the the Honda clone, the 6057, it'll go on a 160. It will not fit a 120, though. Um, the, one, the, the 160 and the 200 is basically the same engine. They got the same bore, the same connecting rod, but the stroke on the 160 is a lot shorter, and the deck height, which that's something a lot of other people don't understand what that is either. The deck height is how tall the block is from the, the crankshaft to the top of the cylinder. That's the deck height. Um, and a 160 has a shorter deck height um, because it's got a shorter stroke. Um, 
lot of people try to put GX200 crankshafts in the, in the 160s, and other than them being tied to a 160 block, the rules that they got to do it, I don't understand why they do it, because um, it's a lot of problems, and you basically got a GX200 when you get done, but um, yeah, the side cover should work, you know, they do work on, on 160s. But, um, yeah, the cart show last week was good. A lot of, I got to meet a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people. A lot of new customers, a lot of old customers, a lot of people we talked to on the phones. Um, you know, it was good putting faces with the voices, like always. Every show we go to, I enjoy meeting, you know, all of our people, all of our customers. Um, and, like I said, my, my cat got more publicity off of these videos than I did up there, but uh, either way, it's all good. Um, but good show, and we're going back. Sometimes, I want to say this also, there's been times in these videos, um, you know, I, I try to go through the questions several times, and there's been Every single video, when I get done, I go back and look at the questions later on or the next morning, and there'll be 10 or 15 or 20 that I didn't even see. They don't show up on here for some reason. Um, so if I don't answer you, um, I'm not ignoring you. I don't see it. That's, that's the problem. Um, I don't know what the dealio is, but um, it will. I, I do go back and answer them, though. Um, whether it be tonight or in the morning, I'll go back and answer the ones that I didn't see. But um, anyway, that's kind of the uh, the gist on the side cover. I'll go over one more thing and answer a few more questions and try to end this a little, wow, 50 minutes. Record. But as I said earlier on our side covers, we put vents up here to vent the block. A lot of discussion, a lot of debate, stuff on, you know, how to vent the block. You know, do you need to, where do you run them, you know, how do you do catch cans. But any, anything you vent, whether it be off the valve cover or whether it be off the side cover or the block, needs to go to a catch can, needs to go to a ventilated catch can. Um, you know, Mountain Dew bottles and Gatorade bottles work temporarily, but a nice, Catch can with a with a filter on it that filter, filters out into the atmosphere is the best thing. Now you can um that's the only one that was loose. Like I say, we got two holes here. Um, you, venting the crankcase is, is is important in modified engines, whether it's a stock stroke or a stroker. Strokers are more important, but the stock stroke, you're turning so many more RPMs than you are on a stock engine. You know, just the AKRAs, NKAs, uh, stuff like that. Off the off the valve cover is all you need. You know, 6500, 6800. You're not creating too much wind that that can't handle. Now, when you get on up to 7500, 8000, 8500, or in some cases, some people, you know, if they don't turn 9000, they're not running. That crankshaft is moving so fast, it's a big fan down there, and that's that big fan is what spreads the oil out and makes it atomize and lubes everything. But it also, that big fan creates a lot of wind. And that wind's got to go somewhere. That's where your, your vents come from. Um, big debates on how to run them. This is what I do. Um, if anybody you know, watches any of my uh, videos on my page or sometimes I put them on here of me dynoing engines. Um, if you notice, most of my outlaw style engines, um, the back, the back, um, make sure I get this right. The back vent, I typically run a line from it up to the valve cover, and the reason I do that is what that does is it kind of equalizes the pressure from the top end of the engine to the bottom end of the engine. Um, it helps keep the oil in the engine a little better because if you just run open vents everywhere, if you don't have perfect seal on your rings, which is almost impossible to get with a wise coat piston because a wise coat piston's only got one ring on the top for it works as a compression and a scraper and then you've got the the, the uh, three piece oil ring and at high RPMs you know 8500 you know plus that ring sometimes loses seal because it's moving so fast it's having to keep all this compression back and you'll get a little bit of blow by into the cylinder 
down to the crankcase, and that creates more pressure down there. Um, so I like running one from the crankcase up to the up to the valve cover, and that kind of it equals the pressure in the, in the engine, helps keep the oil more centralized and, and in the engine. And then the front one, I run to a catch can, a vented catch can. And I also use the one that comes naturally on the valve cover, whether it be a Hemi, non-Hemi, or a clone. They all got one that comes from the factory, and I run that one down to the same catch can. And a lot of people, you know, why, why do you need one from the crankcase to the top? Because it's all connected anyway. I've just found that if I remove that in some engines, I get a little oil that comes out of the engine. Um, the ones that I do that to, I can run 16 ounces in it and run all night long with the same oil, uh, practice heat races and a feature, and I've got less than an ounce in the overflow or the, the uh, in the, what we call a puke tank, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'll unplug that and go back out there and I might lose two ounces during the night. You know, one ounce, two ounce, doesn't matter. Well, the more oil is in the engine, the better it's lubed. I like to run, you know, at least 14 ounces, if not 16, in most most uh, modified strokers. I like running, starting out with 16 and just kind of go from there. But, you know, say what you want to, that works. Run it from, you know, just the one, the very back, um, vent hole, just run a tube up to the valve cover and go, you know, go in from the top or the side. It doesn't really matter. Um, but if you're venting, if you're using the valve cover for a pulse, try not to put it too close to where the pulse is. Um, you know, put it, you know, off to the side more or you use a 90 degree and go in from the side or something like that because if you get it too close to the pulse at high RPMs, it can't affect it. Um, hadn't run into too many problems with that, but you don't want it like right on top of it. So move it kind of, you know, use a 90 degree and go in from the side or whatever. But anyway, I've just found that that helps keep the oil down in the engine where it needs to be. The top end, you know, some, you'll see some oil come out of this and, you know, does it help lube the, uh, the rocker arms? Possibly, because I see oil in it most of the time, um, which helps your top end lube. But it just... It's just worked that way for me for, for quite a while, and, and until I'm proven wrong, um, I'm going to keep doing it that way. Um, but you need, vent, vents are very important on modified engines. And like I said, when you get into a stroker, like with our 175 stroker crank, um, it's moving in a bigger circle, so it's actually creating more air. So, you know, using, you know, venting them uh, helps the engine uh, to exhale. Um, and, and that frees up horsepower. I mean, if the air can get out, if air can get out while the oil can stay in, that's a good thing. The engine's breathing, it can rotate, and there's not, not much, you know, as much drag on the on the crankshaft, which is a big fan in there, and it frees up horsepower. Plus, the oil staying in the engine helps to everything uh, live better. Uh, smoky, um... Smoky Dean Russell. These uh, these side covers, the ones for the clone, the first ones we made, they had cam bearings in them. Um, but we, the cam bearings that we were getting were a high quality bearing and we was getting them from a certain source. And that source is no longer available. And the ones that we were getting from alternate sources weren't as good. And you know, run into a few problems with them. So um, when we made the side cover for the Predator, uh, for the you know the non-Hemi Generation One or Three Predator, we couldn't find a bearing at all that fit it like we wanted it to. Um, some was a little, you know, the bearing was you know a little too thick and went back into it, or it was a little too big, didn't fit the cam just right. So you know we come up with this you know brass insert that's got an oiling system on it. Um, we come up with this probably three years ago or longer. You know, oil comes in from the top, from the side, and it, if you look in the back, um, it's got a channel where the oil comes from behind the cam, so it's well, well, well lubed. And um, just, you know, since we couldn't get the bearings from our, you know, our original source uh, for the clone, 
um, we just went through the same setup on all of them, and it works works very well. Um, you know, we've had a few people that, you know, blow up an engine, it'll break a connecting rod or, or a cam will break, um, crankshaft will break, and it twists the cam in it, it didn't, you know, it'll mess up the bushing in it. And, um, you know, but the same thing would have happened with a bearing in it. You know, I've, I've broken cams and, and flatheads and broken cranks and flatheads, and it'll, I've had it pull the bearing completely out, and it oval shaped that, and, and, and you know, it, it, it ruins the side cover. Um, but uh, since we've gone to this, you know, we haven't had any any oiling problems, wear problems. Um, and I, I've got the first one on a Predator engine that was ever made three years ago. It's still uh, on a Predator engine today. And um, But the way the oiling system works in it and all, it, it gets over lubed, if anything. But that's why they, they longer, no longer have them. The flatheads still have them. We still get our bearings for the flatheads from that source. But um, they just quit making that bearing, and the one we went to just didn't meet our needs like we wanted it to. Um, you don't want to put no no um, subpar bearings in there that's going to come apart or lock up. And I like the Harley Scorchers. Yeah, Harley, Harley has a lot inside their range. They have a lot of brass bushings. You know, a lot of people are surprised when they go in there how many brass bushings and stuff inside of Harley. You would think that they'd be a bunch of ball bearings, but no, they got a lot of um, brass stuff like that. I guess it's good enough for them. It's good enough for us, right? Or it's good enough for us, it's good enough for them. Which way is it? <laughs> is there any advantage to having a vacuum and a crankcase? Well, it keeps all the dirt out of it. Um, a vacuum system, what that would do, you know, is pull the air out. And in cars, it helps. I know used to when I run Legends cars, um, we had a vacuum system on it, and it helped it a lot. It wasn't legal, <laughs> but um, who, who is these days, really? But it, it would help pull because they have a you know pressure lube system, and, and there's not a lot of oil in the pan, and that, that vent system would pull out you know, all of the air off the crankshaft and everything would spin free. The engine would turn more RPMs, it turn up quicker. It, it made more power. I mean, not not no 50 or 60 horsepower, but you know, you could tell a difference. So yes, a vacuum is beneficial in engines with pressure lube system. It's kind of hard to hook one up on these because you know it is a splash lube. You're gonna be splashing oil everywhere, and when you go to vacuum that stuff out, you're gonna be vacuuming the oil out too. So it's been done on flatheads like the um. The breather system we had back in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s for the uh, for the flatheads, um, that was a, a, a back pressure style system. What that done was it had baffles in it, and if any of y'all still got them, hold on to them with their collector's items now. But as it, it the engine, every time the crankshaft rotates, the baffles would open and release air, and then the baffles would close as the piston was coming down, and it would actually create you know, small suction inside and, and help seal the rings from the bottom side, and it, it, it worked really good, really good. We hadn't made them things in many, many years, and we still get calls all the time about them, especially around July and August when the big O's happening. Um, but it's beneficial if you can get it to work, but there again, you got a splash lube system. Yeah, that's, uh, we still got all the time, Stuart, on, you know, when I run late models and stuff, too. Um, actually, we've done it. That's the first way we've done it on a Legends car. Um, because of the way we've done it in a late model, we would run it off the valve cover down to the exhaust and angle it going into the exhaust. And as the exhaust gases go by, it would, it would you know, create a vacuum and suck them out. Um, I think if you do that on one of these engines, about halfway down the straightaway, you're going to be spraying mosquitoes. You're going to be pulling oil out into the exhaust pipe, and it's going to you know, make a smoke screen, which, if you're leading the race, could be beneficial. But. Um, you know, not not really seeing how it could be 100% efficient on here. You'd have to have some type of check valve on it, you know, and it, it would create a light suction and the check valve would close, keep the oil in. It'd be, you know, a complicated system. But people made it work on flatheads and stuff, but I don't see it being, you know, really good on these type of engines. But there is benefits if you can uh, get it to work. You lost your ARC chain tool. Um... Okay, uh, go on to www 
arcracing.com and type in the number 3720 and add a new one to your to your to your uh, shopping cart. Um, that's the, we make the best chain brakes in the business. I've used all of them, all of them, and we make a really really good one. Sell a lot of them. I'm very happy with them. So be glad to sell you nothing. You can call me tomorrow and all. Well, actually, they're not gonna call me tomorrow. I'm not gonna be at work tomorrow. I'm taking tomorrow off. I don't, I don't think most people at work know that. They know it now, but I'm not gonna be at work tomorrow. Just let y'all know. All right, well, um, if we don't get no new questions up here in the next few minutes, I'm going to wrap this up. Kind of go through quick tonight. Dang it. I'm trying to keep it under an hour. I'm going over an hour. But, um, uh, 308. Uh, 308 cam is on the bottom end of wild cams. Um, actually, the F275 cam is a shorter lived cam. It's a wilder, if you want to call it, a more aggressive profile. Um, the 308 is probably the most user-friendly modified cam out there. Um, you don't have to have extreme uh, valve springs on it. You can run 26-pound springs as long as you stay with a one-to-one -one rocker. 26-pound um, springs, and it'll still turn, you know, over 8,500 with 26-pound springs on it. If you go to a one-to-two rocker, especially a one-to-three, you're going to need some duals on it. But the 308 is... Very user friendly and very easy on the valve trans. Why it's a very popular cam, um, but I do like it better with big cars like um, you know, Makunis and Tillerson. But it's a really good cam. We use them a lot. Let's see if I see my question one more time. Yeah, uh, Tina, and Oscar. Uh, I think ARC is number one also. Thank you. All right, well, folks, this is going to be a quick show tonight. My quickest ever. We have set a new world record. Um, but, again, I thank everybody for viewing, uh, logging on and viewing with us tonight. I uh, appreciate the questions. I uh, appreciate all the people that come by at the booth um, in Ohio and spoke with us. I uh, said they you know, appreciate the show, appreciate what we do, and you know, I appreciate you know, being appreciated. You know, we, uh, this is, um, you know, we work really hard, you know, keeping – best parts, not only the best parts in the business, but the best service in the business. Um, and that's, that's where we're reaching out a little more right here with these videos, you know, trying to help the help the little man. But, um, again, I'll post this as soon as I get done, and um, y'all can go back and watch it again because I went through it about 90 miles an hour like I always do, but you can rewind it as many times as you need to. Um, may not get to do another show this month because I'm getting really, 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 really busy at the shop. It might be March before I do another one. I'm not sure, but I'll let everybody know. Um, I'm supposed to be in Robling Road doing a road course race uh, the second weekend of March. I think it's March 10th, 11th, and 12th. Um, I'll actually be racing over there. Uh, this will be my first ever um, enduro race, road race, whatever they call it. It's You go left, you go right, and it's like a two-mile course, and a lot of fun, but I'll be there racing, and um, we uh, no Don, we don't make one for a 40 chain, all it makes for 35. Uh, but um, like I say, probably the second week of March when I get back from over there, I'll probably go live a few times while I'm over there. But um, see y'all again in March. Uh, appreciate everybody stopping by tonight, and y'all have a good evening.